There's a plane going over me. You guys hear that? Uh, all right, let's see. Let's introduce Trevor Hilton and see how the Facebook goes. Trevor Hilton. Hi, I'm Trevor Hilton from Florida A&M University. I am based in the Leon County Extension Office and um, my area of operation is small farms, um, community ag, and um, schools and community gardens. All right, thank you, Trevor. And our final, you know, uh, last but not least, Mr. Matthew Orwat, please introduce yourself. Thank you very much, Mark. My name is Matthew Orwat. I am uh, the horticulture agent in Washington County, and my specialties are ornamental fruit, fruit production and nursery production. Okay, great. Um, Julie, I hope you're, uh, I hope everything's still working out with uh, Facebook. I will end, uh, just remind the, the panelists here and uh, to make sure you got uh, Facebook off. Okay, let's see, let's get to some questions here. So we're talking fruit trees today. And Matthew Orwat, I'm going to start with you. Uh, we have a, you know, um, a question from Zoom saying, I'm new to growing fruit trees, and they're just wanting to start from the beginning. So okay, start if from someone the beginning. in the pain handle is wanting to grow fruit trees and start into this, uh, what, do you, what kind of information do you got for them? Starting from the beginning is a very good place to start. So um, if, if you would like to, to start um, in Florida, uh, a good place to go is to first uh, look at your area where you're going to be planting those fruit trees and get a soil test to determine what your pH is because different fruit trees require different pH uh, have different pH requirements and some uh, you don't just want to throw lime on the ground because that could be detrimental to some fruit trees or beneficial to others so get a pH um, get a soil test uh, for your pH and other nutrients and make sure you have plenty of organic matter in your soil because fruit trees like organic matter. So if you have a really heavy sandy, uh, a real sandy soil or heavy clay soil, incorporation of organic matter in both instances will help your soil. Uh, in addition, we have a publication that was just posted um, for the different uh, dooryard fruit varieties and fruit trees. So start with that dooryard fruit varieties publication it's a very MG24800. It's a very thorough publication. It'll list plants for North Florida. Take that with a grain of salt because in the panhandle, uh, we're a little bit different than North Florida because we're a little west. But for the most part, you can get what you need out of it. Um, you know, uh, I would say if you're starting to start, don't start with peaches or apples when you first begin because peaches and apples are difficult. I would start with, I know you said trees, but I would start with blueberries, uh, but for trees, persimmons grafted onto native, some nurseries in the, in the panhandle that sell persimmon grafted onto native rootstock, get a self-pollinating persimmon like Fuyu, uh, that's a non-astringent self-pollinating uh, plant, um, you know, get another, another plant, another fruit tree. You could do some cold hardy citrus like uh, satsuma or kumquat. Uh, those tend to be pretty good in most cases. Um, you know, those, I would start there and then you can look at, you know, pears. There's some of the, the, the pears aren't so bad to start with, uh, especially some of those uh, hard um, cooking canning pears that you cook with. Kefir comes to mind, uh, Orient, pineapple, Florida home, some of those. So, so that's where I'd start. But first, look at the publication, get your soil tested, and make and look at your soil drainage. Make sure it drains well. So you could do a drainage test if you dig a hole and time for time the length of the draining, how long it takes to drain. Uh, if it drains really fast, or you get a soil test with very poor nutrients, you probably have a real sandy soil. So all that needs to be considered. And what I would do is go whatever county you're in is go talk to your county extension agent, sit down, let them come. Maybe let them come out and take a look at your place or even just show them some pictures and discuss your conditions because it's a very personal thing based on your site. All right. Thank you, Matt. And that leads into a question here for you, Danielle. If you had to pick a, a no fail fruit tree or a fruit tree that, you know, is for the panhandle grows, you know, piece of cake matures quickly. 
what is your unicorn of fruit trees, Danielle, for the panhandle? Well, um, no fail. There's always going to be failure in agriculture and gardening. Um, but if I had to choose, I would choose um, cold hardy citrus. Um, I particularly like satsumas. Um, that is what I would choose. Um, I enjoy um, cooking and, and using the satsumas. Um, and we generally have um, less pests and diseases here. So they um, are easier to grow, I would say, um, than a peach or an apple. So I would start there. All right, thank you, Danielle. Yeah, I know she's, uh, you got a sweet spot for citrus. I know that, um, especially those satsumas. <laughs> um, let's see, Trevor Hilton. So. We have chosen the, um, the fruit tree we need. We've gotten our soil test. What about, what time of year should they be planting this tree? Um, does, well, it, does it matter? There are two schools of thought here. There is one that says plant in the fall and um, have the roots established and be prepared for the summers that we have. And then there's another school that says plant in the spring and have it ready for the winter that we're gonna have. However, um, just make sure if you're planting the fall, make sure that the real hot summer is over before you, you, you probably start planting and make sure you monitor for frost during winter because even cold hardy um, trees will have uh, some frost damage when they're young. I'm muted. Uh, I've heard Trevor talk a lot about, um, you know, when containerized plants really can be planted uh, throughout the year, it's just how much stress they go through. So um, yeah, good uh, recommendation there, Trevor. And even with the cold hardy, uh, make sure you protect them when they're young because they might be a little sensitive. Um, Trevor, one more for you. When you're picking that tree, um, what are you looking for with that tree in the container? What do you want to see? Okay, if you, you're going to the nursery to buy a tree, make sure there are no broken branches. Make sure there's no tear on the, the barks and, um, you know, branches are evenly spaced, growing in a good direction, about 40 to 60 degrees. And um, if you're looking at more mature trees, make sure at least there is um, about two thirds of the tree has branches on it. And depending on what season you're, you're, you're buying, they, the leaves should match that season. So if, if it's spring, then those leaves should be green. And um, look at the root, make sure that they are, you know, uh, whitish, yellowish if they start looking real black and the root ball having any kind of mild order then that might not be a good choice okay good advice and i always like to tell folks make sure that the size of the tree matches the size of the container right so it may seem like a really good deal to buy a big tree in a tiny container but it's usually a reason that they're discounted so uh you know make sure that that matches up um Let's see, for Danielle, uh, fruit tree fertilization. So is there any general guidance? Do you treat them all the same? Or is there you know, specific needs for specific types of fruit trees? I'm gonna actually defer that question to Trevor because I think he has more experience with a lot more fruit trees than I do. Ooh, we're gonna pass. Are we allowed to do that, Julie? I we'll do it, okay. Okay. As far as um, um, Matt earlier um, started out by saying, start with a soil test so you know, you know what you're dealing with. But without a soil test, um, you could use a general purpose fertilizer like a 666 or a 888. And um, that would work well. It is not suggested that you use uh, 
say a 10, 10, 10 on younger plants, but the older plants, you, you would be okay using, using that. Um, it, we, we have a little <laughs> um, difference of opinion. Mark and I, we were uh, fertilizing the fruit trees in the demonstration orchard. And um, I would look at the size of the, the, the trunk of the, the tree. And um, for every inch in diameter, I say, well, okay, you give about uh, a, a pound of uh, fertilizer. Somebody say, well, for every year that the tree has been alive, you, you, give a, you give a pound. So it works back to about the same thing. So when we, we did our calculation, we both ended with, with, this, with the same amount. Yeah, Trevor was like, it's a it's a pound per inch. And I was like, well, you know, IFAS has in their official recommendation, it's so much per, you know, whatever it was, square feet or something. You know, I did all the calculations and lo and behold, it's pretty much the same exact thing Trevor had come up with. So um, that works out. And I saw, uh, Susie, we're going to talk about pawpaws here in a little bit towards the end. And someone had a question on strawberry guava and Matt Lawler posted a comment. And maybe we'll get back to that later when we get into some other fruit trees. Um, all right, for all of you all, uh, anyone want to handle this one? This is some general fruit tree selection maintenance type of question. If you live near the coast and salt spray is an issue, um, what, what kind of fruit trees do you think would be best? This person lives near the coast. They're trying to, you know, line the property with fruit trees. Uh, you know, you think that's going to be possible? And if so, which trees would maybe be best for that situation? <laughs> Um, anyway, <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure, but I, I, I could start by saying one that I know would not work. And, <laughs> you know, um, so some of your uh, uh, peaches and all that would probably have, have a hard time, time working there. Um, pomegranate would probably be a good a good choice because they are somewhat salt tolerant. So I, I would figure that that would be one good one. Papa possibly, depending on you know how close you are to, to the coast, but that might also be a good option. Danielle, are you familiar with citrus and salt tolerance? Is there any... Um, you know, I am mark? not. I cannot speak to that. Um, well, this is one we might have to look up some more information for. You know, we uh, uh, we're extension agents, but by by all means, we don't know everything. So this is one we might have to go look up and get back to you on that one. That's a great question, though. Um, let's see. Moving on to so that was kind of general fruit tree questions. We got a lot of questions dealing with citrus. Uh, you know, we we do have the orange on our license plate here in Florida. A lot of us love to grow citrus. Um, so let's get into some citrus questions here. And Matt, this one's going to be for you first. Uh, it's kind of a general, you know, how do you care for citrus trees? And you kind of went over site and soil test. Um, but are there any differences in like, you know, Meyer lemon versus key limes in North Florida or you know, just some overall, some general care and maintenance for citrus trees? Yes, definitely. There are. So first of all, yeah, on the site, depends on what you purchase, but Keep in mind that any young tree is going to need a lot more protection from the cold than a mature tree. So if you plant a young Satsuma tree, for example, it will probably need some protection until it's mature, say for three years, and then it, it could be fine out in the open. But preferred on a south-facing slope is the preferred place for any citrus. If you're trying to grow some of the less cold-hardy types, especially like um, a tangerine or a navel or uh, an orange, regular orange uh, if it's against on a south side against a building and under under light pine coverage pines tend to break up some of that frost so you know uh that kind of selection is good i know someone that grows a great great fruit on years without issues they had we had that really bad had freeze there was not fruit was a healthy tree still and it's against a building on a south facing slope under pines soil we talked about that already um maintenance uh contrary to popular belief 
Citrus trees do not require pruning beyond removal of crossing branches or dead or diseased wood. And as those trees get heavy fruit loads, the, bench, the branches tend to bend and people get worried and they want to cut them off. But those will probably stay bent and go down to the ground. And that's actually a good thing. I've seen the best looking citrus trees hadn't been ever been pruned heavy and they look really good um, when they get older. Um, uh, only the exception to that is if you're trying to keep weeds under control under the trees, it's good to keep the, the branches off the ground, but that might not be such a big deal for the homeowner. You might not mind the more branches, the more wood the tree has, the more cold tolerant will be. It will be able to withstand cold a lot better. Um, any differences? Well, of course there are a uh, key lime would need much more protection than say a satsuma or a kumquat or a, even a Meyer lemon. Meyer lemon can be grown pretty well um, as long as they're protected when they're young and on a south facing slope uh, and not in the wind. Uh, there's uh, with Meyer lemon though, um, sometimes there's some dieback, but the good news is they, they fruit on, on new wood. So you wouldn't necessarily have issues uh, that would keep them from fruiting for very long. And a lot of times Meyer lemon trees are propagated on their own roots from cuttings instead of being grafted. So if they did die to the ground, oftentimes they'll come back true to type and not be totally dead. So uh, that's what I have there on those differences. But yes, I've seen someone grow a key lime here in Chipley um, in a protected environment. That's an old tree, but I wouldn't say that could be done everywhere in every scenario. Okay, thanks, Matt. Uh, Danielle, fertilizing satsuma. So this is this specifically to satsumas, your favorite? Uh, when should they stop? And is there a fertilizer schedule? So generally for our area, um, because we do um, have the potential for a freeze, um, we say the end of July to stop fertilizing. Um, and so not to apply fertilizer, um, you know, from August until generally like February 15th or so. Um, and the reason why that is, is, is because we don't want the tree to flush during the winter um, or create that new growth. Um, because when that happens, that new growth is real tender and susceptible to a freeze. Um, so that is important. And so obviously, you know, fertilizing induces that new growth. Um, so I would say the end of July. Okay, that uh, it's good advice. We often tell folks that with your lawns too, right? Don't fertilize too late in the season because you'll get that tender growth that's sensitive. Um, all right, Xavier, let's get you in here because, uh, you know, citrus, we're talking about citrus. Many of us have heard of citrus greening. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what is going on in our area regarding citrus greening and how can folks verify whether their plants are infected or not? Okay, so let's start with what is citrus greening? Uh, it's a disease that um, impacts uh, all the citrus production, mostly in South Florida, uh, up to Gainesville basically. And it's a citrus that is due to a bacteria and this bacteria is transmitted by a small insect that called a cilid. Uh, Cilid is um, same order than um, aphids. Um, it's kind of this big family aphids, which like so it's a pressing, sucking insect basically. And so it's one that will feed on the leaf of the uh, of the leaf of your citrus that the bacteria will be transmitted. Um, and it's a deadly uh, deadly disease. It, would kill your trees in a matter of four to five uh, years. And while your trees is infected, the, the, the fruits that is produced are not very good, they're very sour, they're misshaped. Um, so uh, basically, once your tree is infected, it will eventually dead and doesn't produce very good uh, fruits. The good news for um, North Florida, excuse me, is that um, right now greening is limited uh, only on the coast. We found it only on um, the, the, uh, the Gulf Coast. So uh, uh, Franklin, Gulf counties. Um, but when you go inland, so near Tallahassee, Quincy, uh, Jefferson County, we don't have um, greening. Uh, 
we may have some pockets, you know, of some cluster of, of with the seeded, but not the disease. So that's the good news. So I would really encourage you, if you want to grow citrus uh, and you are in the panhandle to do so, because we don't yet have the, um, the disease. Um, once said that, we have to be very uh, vigilant because we know that the seeded and the disease and the bacteria survive winter. So, uh, and there's no reason that it will, could not establish in Australia. So it's very important to uh, check on a regular basis your citrus to know if they might be infected. So how do you know your citrus is infected by greening? Well, the first indicator is look if you have seeded, that's a good good start. Uh, how do you know you have seeded? You look at the small flush, you know, the small shoot that the citrus is producing, um, this new, new little leaves. And if you have seeded, they will be there because the seeded only feed on new uh, on these new leaves and they reproduce on them. So um, there are some link where you can look at what uh, the seeded look like. Um, and if you see seeded, that's kind of your first uh, indication. You should contact your uh, extension agent and uh, and try to uh, eliminate your seed. And then after you can look at the um, your leaves, the leaves of your citrus, and see if they have symptoms of greening. So the issue with greening, uh, citrus greening, is that a lot of the symptoms can be due to other um, cause. Their thing can be due to um, fungi, can be due to uh, nutritional deficiency, uh, but that's still still few symptoms that you can look at. One of the best is to look at the uh, yellowing of your leaves. So you will look, you know, look at your leaves and you will see if the decoloration is asymmetrical. So if you have some spot of yellowing on your on your leaves, but that's not symmetrical, well, it might be an indication that you have reading. Also defoliation is important. Uh, if your tree starts to losing a lot of leaves, that may be an indication. Look at the shape of your uh, uh, fruits. Uh, if they are, the, the fruits are not a uh, very regular shape, they are mis misshaped. If the, color um, the, re the coloration is not homogeneous, that might be an indication that your uh, citrus is infected. Again, we have in the in 80s, we have a lot of documentation on how to recognize uh, citrus greening visually. So it's a good starting point. If you really think your citrus is infected, the, uh, the best is to send some leaf sample to, um, to us, to uh, the NFRC. Uh, we have a lab diagnostic that will run the test for you and we let you know if your tree is infected. Um, so the only way to really determine that your tree is infected is to do a PCR and to know if the tree is infected. I would say that if your tree is infected, uh, I will recommend uh, to remove your tree as soon as possible because there's no cure for this disease anyway and your tree will produce uh, fruit that are not good anyway and it can be a source um, of, of the disease and can expand to, and can spread to other trees. So um, that's what I have to say. Thank you very much, Xavier. Um, and just for everyone to know, you know, the, the North Florida Research Education Center, they do take, uh, they have a plant diagnostic lab there. So that's where you would send your uh, citrus. Uh, but if you have other uh, plant issues with fungal or disease problems, uh, they also will accept them and help uh, rec um, you know, try to confirm what's what's bothering your plant. We'll try to get the we'll get the link up for that submittal form here in a little bit. Um, let's see, Trevor. I'm going to jump to you. We just got a question in the chat here about you know how aggressively can Satsuma be pruned. Matt Orwat was just talking about you know really they don't actually necessarily need pruning, but you know may need some. And then we had some questions that were also attached to pruning. Um, you know, does it minimize fruit production loss? Does, uh, you know, is it, you know, Matt talked a little bit about those Meyer lemons, especially, you know, but they get a lot of fruit on them. They kind of branches, you know, fall onto the ground. Uh, talk to us a little bit about pruning citrus, Trevor, and if those branches need to be pruned, left alone, what do you think? I, I'm with Matt on this one. Um, citrus doesn't really need pruning except as he outlined, disease or crossing branches, that kind of stuff. But the other, the other time is if the tree is growing out of control. I have seen an orange tree that was as tall as a four-story building. 
So yes, they can grow, especially if they're competing for light. So if you have a tree that is growing out of control and you need to reduce the size, yes, you can do some aggressive cutback. Citrus is very, very forgiving. So you don't have to worry about you terminating the, the, the tree. But you don't want to go in and take off more than a third of the, the, the tree at any one time. So yes, you can do some pruning to control size. And of course, if you, if you do heavy pruning, you will lose some production. It's, you know, it's just natural. Um, as far as the best time for this, usually after you have um, harvested your fruit, so are, you know, maybe early spring near about. Okay, thank you, Trevor. I know Trevor often tells folks if you are climbing tall on a ladder to collect citrus, you know, it may be a little dangerous. Maybe go ahead and prune that thing down to, you know, get it more in the shape. Um, Matt Orwat, you mentioned this already, I think, but touch on it again quickly. Uh, grafting of Meyer lemons. Maybe just talk about grafting and citrus in general. Um, I think you already mentioned that a lot of Meyer sure. lemons are usually not grafted. So uh, if you're in Florida, uh, the, you need to buy citrus trees from a certified nursery where they graft uh, from a certified nursery. They don't want you buying from just some buddy down the street that is grafting trees. Um, a lot of Meyer lemons though are not, some are grafted onto say uh, trifoliate orange or swingle or some of those other root stocks. And some are just uh, sold as rooted cuttings. And that's okay too. If, if the nursery sells them as rooted cuttings, as ungrafted plants, that's fine. They're they grow pretty well as on their own roots. And that's an advantage if, they get froze if they freeze to the ground in a cold spell they'll come back from their root system and sometimes even fruit that same year so uh, they they fruit on newer growth than other citrus trees meyer lemon is not really a lemon it's a it's a hybrid between lemon and orange but it has the flavor of a lemon without being as sour i do like it um one other thing that mentioned about size that trevor touched on um if you are happy if you know you're going to have a tree that gets too tall and you don't want to deal with it uh, there's a rootstock called flying dragon and some nurseries sell satsuma and other citrus trees grafted onto flying dragon and they generally don't get taller than six feet when they're on that rootstock i have produced has planted two rows of satsuma on flying dragon for you pick the rest he's going to harvest and sell but he wants those two shorter trees two rows of shorter trees for you pick so um, that's an option too, is a dwarfing rootstock. Very cool. Um, Matt, I'm gonna stick with you. Uh, what okay. would cause my citrus leaves to look bad? Wow, that's a, that's a broad question there. Um, there's, <laughs> it depends if you're calling nutrition. So for example, if you have yellowing, a lot of times it could be a magnesium or nitrogen deficiency. Magnesium deficiency will, will have a V pattern on the older leaves in that's yellow, whereas a nitrogen deficiency or even iron deficiency would have an overall yellowing and chlorotic look to the leaves, okay? It could be something that's caused by, uh, what common would be citrus rust mite. Uh, I mean, citrus leaf miner. Citrus leaf miner will, these wiggles all over the leaves and it can make new growth look real crinkled and messed up. So citrus leaf miner could be the cause of these bad looking leaves. Um, I've seen feeding by aphids ca and cause bad le looking leaves because it'll leave a sticky residue on the leaves and that will create sooty mold. So they'll have a black mold on them. So there's lots of things that can make the leaves look bad. So you'd ha really need to send in some pictures to your extension agent and let them diagnose that. Yeah, because we could either have a, a nutrient deficiency. It could be an insect related. Yeah. It could fungal or disease related uh, i often get white flies uh, white flies yeah, so, yeah so they can do sooty mold too sooty mold and make the leaves stippled white flies most of the time would be um controlled i was we speak about citrus white flies yeah so citrus that's... white flies that most of the time that would be controlled by a um a fun a, fu a fungi that is a beneficial fungi yes and, i have it on my citrus and that would kill your nymphs and it's true that if you look at the leaves, you may say, oh, the leaf doesn't look good because they have all, um, it's, it's like a rust on, it, on the leaf, you know? 
and it looks like a fungal disease, but in fact, it's a very, it's a, it's a beneficial fungi because it will kill all your um, um, names of uh, white flies, uh, citrus yes, white flies. I've, I've found it on my own citrus trees. It's really great. Uh, it's like an orange colored fungus that- Yeah, uh, goes so if you don't know, you will think it's a disease, uh, but in fact, it's very positive. And uh, usually citrus white flies are rarely an issue. You have to have a lot of them on your leaves for it become an issue. And in this case, uh, probably try to find this fungi in the nature and try, you know, to um, uh, spray some solution of the, of the sport directly on it. And, uh, uh, Xavier, I'm gonna stick with you because uh, leaf miners, if you've grown citrus, you've probably experienced leaf miners and for the homeowner, for the backyard citrus grower, what is your best recommendation? You know, people are saying there's a chat here. I struggle maybe, with. Leaf you may be disappointed, but uh, I will. I will tell you. So, what's the leaf manor first? The leaf manor. It's a small moth. It's a small. It's a small uh, moth, and uh, the adult. You probably not notice the adult. It's a very small moth that is active on the morning, on the evening. Uh, and what makes the damage is not the adult. It's the uh, larvae. Now, the in this case, it's a small caterpillar, and the larvae does this damage to the leaf by creating um, swallow tunnels, which we call mines, in young leaves. Um, and this is very common, uh, so in citrus, uh, uh, and in fact, it's doing better when you don't have too high temperature, so it do it particularly well in um, North Florida. Um, and uh, the question about the damage, uh, it's, it's interesting because uh, if you are a homeowner, in fact, it's not very aesthetic, but by himself doesn't do much to your, uh, to your tree. It's mostly an issue for uh, big growths where they, uh, the grower want to grow the tree pretty fast and have a good yield. For a homeowner, it's less an issue. Um, because this uh, shiny uh, leaf, you know, uh, leaves you're gonna have the mature tree, all the mature tree with a dense canopy, they will tolerate that uh, sometime at pretty high numbers. Uh, and the effect at the end is pretty uh, uh, negligible uh, on your uh, tree growth and on the free yield. Only very young trees uh, may, um, you know, um, suffer uh, more damage because they have less foliage. So of course, if all the, tr the, f the leaves are uh, with leaf miner, then your growth will be uh, slowed. And so that might be an issue. Um, but eventually the, your tree will recover and will produce tree. Um, the leaf miner will never kill your tree. Uh, so the only thing they can do, it's, uh, this, it's not very aesthetic. It may slow down the growth of your trees, but eventually your tree will recover and when it will be uh, a mature tree, it will produce uh, fruit. Let's say you really don't want this to happen. You don't really don't like it. Um, first of all, let's uh, know that you have um, natural limits that works pretty well. So you can let the natural growing on. Um, if you don't spray insecticide, you have some, some kind of control. Same thing if your winter is uh, pretty, um, if the winter is um, pretty short, like this year, in fact, you have, we have a very pretty short uh, winter, uh, your uh, leaf minor population is gonna be low. So you probably don't need any treatment. If we're in a year where uh, leaf minor population is pretty high, uh, there are different ways you can really control it. The first way um, that you can try is, uh, uh, one way I like it is called the Attract and Kill. It's sold by a company. Uh, and basically it's a mix of an attractant, uh, a sexual attractant and uh, an insecticide, but it's very, um, I would say, a soft insecticide and so the um the advantage is that you will put this drop of attract and kill on your leaves and the moth will go will feed on it absorb the poison and die so so in fact this um it doesn't spill there's no uh no no damage uh other uh, and all, no no other insect than the leaf miner is really uh, targeted so that's why i like this product if you really want to treat it 
another solution, if you want to do it, uh, SERT is uh, matting description, but that's quite complicated for homeowner. So for homeowner, I would really stick with this attract and kill. Um, I don't know if we can give name of company. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. It's called Alpha Sense doing that. And uh, it's a company in the, um, in Oregon. And they, they do a pretty good job. It, it, it works well for small, uh, you know, if you have one or two trees uh, in your garden and you really uh, want to uh, avoid this issue. But keep in mind that leaf miner don't, at the end of the day, uh, will not kill your trees, will not um, reduce your your um, the number of fruits that your mature trees will produce. Great, good to know. Uh, hopefully, all y'all with leaf miners feel a little bit, you know, less stressed out about it all now. Um, let's see here. Next up, all right, Danielle, I'm going to come to you. You know, we planted our citrus. We've been fertilizing it. We, you know, it's pruned. We've been watching for insects. How do we know when the fruit is ripe? <laughs> um, color is a good indicator. Um, with like tangerines and your, your satsumas, um, generally they will not, um, they'll ripen on the tree um, and not ripen, you know, after you pull them off. Um, so color, um, some of them will have a little bit of green on them. Um, even though they may be ripe. So um, I personally like to, you know, take taste test and, you know, try some and see. Um, that's usually a good indicator. Um, if the fruit is not that sweet, then you would probably want to leave it on the tree. Um, so Tre Trevor yeah, and I- the, the fruit's going to sweeten. Tre Trevor and I personally like it when you- What was that? Trevor and I personally like it. If you need to test, you bring it by the extension office and your extension agents will test it out for you, right, Trevor? <laughs> uh, Danielle, I'm gonna stick with you. One like more question. Why would there maybe not, you know, a satsuma tree with very little fruit or none? You know, what's going on there? So, um, depends, I guess, when it was planted. So generally, you know, um, it takes, the tree, you know, a little bit longer, as we say, you know, four to five years um, to become established and to set um, good fruit and ripen. Um, so a lot of times, you know, when you go to a nursery or, you know, a big box store and get um, a tree, a lot of times they have fruit on them already and they're in containers. And so um, the roots are confined to that you know, small space. So when you, you know, plant the tree, um, you know, the roots have more room to grow. And then sometimes the tree will, you know, go back to a juvenile, you know, stage and um, stop producing fruit. Um, but that's actually good because you want the tree for the first, you know, three years to focus its energy um, into growing strong, healthy roots in the stems um, and not necessarily fruit. Um, so that's going to make a, you know, a stronger tree. Um, if it is a mature tree, um, some citrus is alternate bearing, so you might have a really heavy crop load one year and then the following year, um, not as much fruit. So okay. that could be, that could and be. And then always, way. if you got more questions, you contact your Danielle Sprague or your local extension agent. <laughs> Um, all right, let's see. There was a, a question for all the panelists. All right, Matt Orwat, Trevor, and Danielle. And I think Xavier, I don't know where Xavier took off to, uh, but you three, what would be your favorite citrus variety? Can I go first? Please. Okay. I, Just I've one, told one. A, a lot of folks, um, I say if you have only enough space for one citrus tree, just one. I say plant a pumpkin tangerine. It has, it, it, it ripens early. It has very few seeds. It peels easily and it produces a lot of fruit. And not only that, you would probably start having fruit in it within the first two to three years. 
Okay, Punk and Tangerine. P O N K A N. Is that how you spell yeah. that? Yeah. Okay, Danielle, what about you? I, wait, I think I know what she's going to say, but go ahead, Danielle. Actually, so I like my favorite, <laughs> I have two favorites that I really like to eat. And <laughs> the pomelo is my favorite. Um, and then um, Dr. Anderson at the NFREC, um, who is a retired horticulturalist, he has um, a bud blood orange planted there, and they're amazing. I um, don't have any of these planted, but I have that on my a bud blood um, on my list of, of um, citrus to plant. Currently, I have um, tangos, a bingo tree, and satsuma trees. <laughs> I thought you were going to say Satsuma. Uh, yeah, well, I love Satsuma, so. Uh, all right, Matthew Orlott, what about you? Oh, you're muted, Matt. You're muted, sorry. For something unusual that I've seen here grown locally that's, that, that people have success with, it's the Nippon Orange Quat. It's a hybrid between uh, the orange, uh, Japanese orange and a, a kumquat. And they're, they're kind of small, but they are very flavorful in cooking. The, the rinds are very nice in like orange chicken preparation. The, the juice is great for cooking. Um, I'd highly recommend it. And what Trevor said about the tangerines, I've never tried the, what was, how do you spell that again? The pom pumpkin, pumpkin. pumpkin tangerine. I've never tried it, but I have tried the Lee tangerine. I bet they're very similar. Uh, that's been grown. It needs some shelter to do well because of uh, up here in the, at least by Chipley, it's colder, but uh, they're in tangerines can be incredibly sweet, easy to peel, have thin rind, few seeds. And if you can find a shelter spot to grow a tangerine, I would say that would be their the best tasting citrus I've ever had. A fresh tangerine is hard to beat. They're hard to s s buy low in the store because they don't ship well, but growing your own with that really thin peel, it's, it's really good. Yeah. All right. Um, we got a few uh, questions regarding citrus that came in on the Zoom that I'm going to ask. Um, the one was, do potted key limes, do they need to be root pruned? So I don't know who wants to handle this, maybe Matt or Trevor. So they got a key lime that they're keeping in a pot. Should that thing be root pruned every now and again? I would say, I'm going to say occasionally, yes. So it's what, kind of like what does Trevor say? As it kind of fills into that pot, pull it out every now and again and check and see if you need to bring it back. I would say any any large um, plant you're keeping in a pot, you're going to have to do some root pruning, you know, from time to time. And then there was another question about: Do citrus do well espaliered? Hmm. Yeah. I've never seen it, but <laughs> why why would it not? <laughs> yeah. yeah, why not? Huh? Uh, they are pretty. They grow. They put out a lot of foliage. Yeah. Probably yeah. get it green it over time. Um, all right, um, we are now moving away from citrus. We got some other. We got about fifteen minutes here, and we did get some questions about other fruit trees and shrubs. So, uh, Matt, I'm going to come to you to ask about peach tree pruning. So you okay. already mentioned. You already and mentioned. Don't start with peach trees if you want to start with fruit trees. But tell us. I just mean, they can do fine if you are willing to put in the time and effort, and you can. They have a uh, the answer is definitely yes. open. The, the most common way to prune peaches is open center uh, style, the open center. And instead of going into great detail by, by verbal, which you would no one would get because it's just talking about it, there's a great publication that's posted uh, that, that uh, Matt Lawler will post from our team's document that ha talks about has lots of really good pictures for peach pruning. Um, but open center, uh, so that you can, so the tree doesn't get too tall where you can get the peaches easily. And the other thing is they, uh, to make sure when you prune, um, you know, to do the best time for pruning would be, uh, late December, early January, but also sometimes people prune a after a large flush in August. However, uh, you don't want to prune off the fruiting spurs, uh, and the fruiting wood because that's cutting off the fruit for the next year I'll put a document on pruning peach trees uh that i would say review that because that's 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 what i'd recommend 
Yeah, and um, I think it, we found out Xavier lost his internet. So uh, the, one of the issues with peaches are all the pest problems um, and diseases. And so there is a document and maybe Matt and um, Beth for Facebook and Zoom. Uh, I know there's a link in there about, it's a link to a, an EDIS kind of um, topic page, but it's got, uh, there's documents for um, peach disease management, insect management, uh, and I think there was one on weeds or, or you know, something or other, but hey. uh, they do require quite a, they are a little bit of high maintenance crop, uh, especially to get, you know, a nice peach that you're comfortable picking right off and taking a bite out of. So, and, uh, and I'll post a link to one from university of Georgia. It's a good homeowner doc because the ones for UF tend to be focused on commercial production. So yeah. I will post that UGA link here in a minute. Great. Thank you, Matt. All right, let's go to bananas. Um, Trevor, how long does it take for a banana to ripen on the plant? And should you let it ripen fully or cut it while green? Okay, why, why did I know you were going to ask me that question? Hey. Anyway, um, <laughs> uh, banana. I don't see a lot of bananas. Um, grow into maturity here in Tallahassee, but, but in a few instances, yes, they do. Your best option, in my opinion, for fruits that will continue ripening on, on the counter, your best option is to pick that fruit before it ripens and let it ripen. You run the risk of, um, you know, raccoons, squirrels, and all these other um, animals that want a piece of your crop. They will come in and get it. So your best option is to harvest early. Um, as far as how long it takes, I I had a banana that uh, started fruiting in August and it didn't make it before the first frost. So I think they run close to um, a, a good six, seven months before you, from the time they start um, uh, sending out that flower to, to when you, you can get a fruit that will ripen. Most of the bananas that you buy in the supermarket are not harvested right. They're, they're harvested green and then they're, um, they're ripened in a ripening room. Uh, there's a question that just came in, Trevor, on plantains. And uh, this uh, person has plantains. They fall over before the bunch gets ripe. Um, what's, you know, what do you think might be happening there? And again, plantains tend to be, you know, much heavier than um, bananas. And um, so, yes, you can have that happening. You you need to prop those trees. Well, I say trees without, you know, <laughs> out of context. <laughs> you need to prop them up to, to so to prevent them from. So as soon as they start leaning, you need to prop them up so they don't fall over. They 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 can get very top heavy. Okay, thank you, Trevor. Uh, let's see, uh, Danielle, uh, blueberries. So someone's trying to grow blueberries in containers. What kind of soil mix would you recommend? Right, so blueberries um, require, you know, an acidic type soil, um, soil. So um, for a mix for growing in a pot, Probably something like, you know, 50% potting soil, maybe 50% peat moss or pine bark um, so that they can um, you know, grow in, in that acidic medium. I don't know if, um, if you know, Trevor or Matt have any, any other. Yeah, sounds pretty good. I know that the, uh, a lot of blueberry growers, you know, even growing in the ground will often, um, you know, once they're, when they're planting that bush, they will loaded up with shredded pine bark uh, kind of as a growing medium right there. Uh, Trevor, Matthew, you got anything else you want to ask? Well, I, I like um, Danielle says, even when I'm planting in the ground, I would dig the holes and I would add um, peat moss to the holes before I plant. So, you know, that, that works for well for, for me and um, just make sure that um, as you fertilize, you use a, um, you know, an acid forming fertilizer that would also help. That's a, 
That's a great point, Trevor, with that, because uh, a lot of times our irrigation water has a high pH, and that would be detrimental. Mm. So an acid-forming fertilizer marketed as blueberry special is one type that has the acid acidity for it. And uh, what Trevor mentioned for peat moss, sometimes an economical way of getting it, um, it is by the bale. Is mm. either a bale potting soil or the if you buy it in a bag, if you, the compressed bales are the most economical way. Just FYI, if you're trying to buy a lot of that. All right. Um, let's see. Let's move on to persimmons. So I think I had Trevor down because I know Trevor, uh, he's got several persimmons going at our office. So, uh, you know, sorry, Trevor, I picked on you a couple of times. Okay. Um, you know, give us an idea on the general basics of growing persimmons. When are they ripe? What's the tree spacing? And we did get a persimmon specific question that maybe you can address as well. I think about uh, fruit drop. So, oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, persimmons, uh, there are many different varieties and some, um, some trees are relatively small. I have one that is probably no more than about six, seven feet tall. And it, I think it has reached its mature height. And then I have another, um, I mentioned the Fuyu, they, they can get um, very big. And um, so like citrus, it's not one of those that you have to prune regularly. I would say prune if you have to control the size somewhat, but any broken disease or you know damaged branches, crossing branches, that kind of stuff, you do those kind of maintenance. They persimmons, in my opinion, fall in the low maintenance fruit trees. So for folks who are starting out, that should be one of your choice as opposed to um, peaches and apples and, and plums. So <clears throat> the spacing, the recommended spacing is uh, about 20 feet apart. I, if you, if you decide to do close, close management like I did, we went down to 15 feet apart and we were okay with, with 15 feet. And um, as far as when they're ripe, the none the astringent variety will continue ripening once they're harvested, but your non-astringent variety, you know, pretty much um, stop ripening then. And um, Danielle mentioned earlier, uh, a lot has to do with tasting. So you try and you, you, you know, you, you, you get a feel for when, when it's ripe. Bring it to the extension office. Yeah. <laughs> I have never actually ate a persimmon. Um, oh. I did get a tree from the nursery this year. Um, so hopefully I will. Um, we do have like a small um, you pick here, persimmon you pick in Jefferson County. So I'll be going this year to try persimmons. <laughs> recommend Danielle they're they're kind of goopy when you eat them but the astringent ones are so sweet they're so so sweet um you got to eat them when they're soft they're, they're really good uh so folks it's about three minutes till well two o'clock eastern and one central uh I do want to put a link in the chat about a survey so uh the the maestros back behind the scenes if you could post the survey link on Facebook and Zoom this is for the attendees if you are able to, uh, you know, please fill out the survey, let us know what you thought. Um, we do have about four more questions or so uh, to go over. Uh, so if you get got, you all don't mind sticking around a little bit longer, we will answer those. And we got uh, pawpaws, pomegranates, passion fruit coming up. Uh, so if you're interested in those fruits, uh, stick around and maybe we'll bring up avocados. I've heard several people have been asking about avocados on Facebook. So um, let's see, let's see. I feel like I keep picking on Trevor, but uh, this one's on. Does anyone else want to talk about pawpaw? Matt or Danielle, do you want to take pawpaws? Or should we, should we pass the buck to Trevor? I don't know a whole ton about pawpaws. I take Not it. Either. Trevor, I take it's, all you. it's all you, Trevor. Well, we can tell you about pawpaw. They, they can grow 
very tall. They could get up to about 20 feet by about 15 feet wide. They will grow in a varied condition. They can grow in full sun and shade. They would even grow a, um, in areas that would normally be too wet for other fruit trees. As a matter of fact, they're, they're known to grow on river banks. So they, 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 they're very versatile. They live very long. They could live up to 80 years. So, so it's a good tree to have. They don't have a lot of pests or disease problems and they don't require a lot of maintenance in terms of uh, pruning or you know those kind of stuff. And um, they, for those who don't know, the papa, the fruit is kind of like a cross between a mango and a banana. That's what it tastes like. And um, I would tell you this much: they, they, if you are in a hurry. To, you're, you're planting a tree and you're in a hurry, then the papa is not the tree to plant because it's going to take a few years before they actually start producing. Yeah, how long have the ones in our demonstration garden been installed? They took prob in, in, maybe in excess of five years before we, get, we got the first fruit. And then not only that, the first fruits we got were probably about the size of my thumb. And... <laughs> And we, we might have gotten about two or three fruit that year. Then the following year, we got a few more and the fruit size went up. This year was pretty good. I, I was one of those who was saying that, um, because I thought the squirrels and the raccoons, the birds and all that weren't very happy to forage on those because I went to the, the, the orchard and the fruits were falling on the ground. And, Nobody, you know, none of these um, wildlife were seem to be interested in it. But I understand that in some areas, yes, the the raccoons and the squirrels love them. Well, but I know now our, our squirrels and raccoons are not familiar with them, so they haven't started yeah. yet. We have those city squirrels, uh, but Rachel Mathis is the new wildlife of uh, you know you got to watch out for with the pawpaws at our place now. She watches them when they fall and eats them. Um, all right, there's pop All right, pomegranates. All right, so uh, pomegranates. Let's see again. I had Trevor written down for this one. It was about planting pomegranate seeds from Publix. You know, what do you think about that? And then there was a <laughs> there, and I know what you're going to say. There's another question <laughs> that came in via via chat that said that they have a Russian pomegranate. Um, you know, how do you get it to produce? It keeps flowering and blooming, but then no fruit yeah, set. Yeah. So we have the same problem. We, we have the same problems. And growing from seeds, no. The seeds probably going to take you about two months before they germinate. So there goes two months already. And then when you, if they do germinate and they produce, they're probably not going to be true to form. So, you know, you would have wasted they're probably going to take a good five, six years before their fruit. So you wasted that much time only to get something that's not what you thought it was. It's best to grow pomegranate from cuttings. And um, that seemed to be, you know, a better option. I, I, the only place I've seen pomegranates grow real well was in India, and I understand out in California there are some that do real well. But the ones I saw in India were, you know, I mean, just unbelievable. Small trees producing hundreds of fruits. My tree at the office doesn't do real well. I get one or two fruit every year, and they seem to be a magnet for stink bugs. So uh, I. The, the beauty of it, though, is that they are very attractive um, uh, trees, so it would be something that would be, you know, could be very good, you know, a dual purpose tree for your landscape. All right, thank you, Trevor. Now, Mr. Orwat, coming to nuts, pecan trees. Okay. What do, what's going on if the pecans fall and there's no nut in there? Oh, uh, if, with, uh, if they're empty? Yeah, they're pecans, does. right? So, in that case, there's could be several things going on. First of all, we have a disease 
here called pecan scab and if it, if that attacks the the nuts they oftentimes will be empty and shriveled up inside and that's point one point two uh it could be lack of pollination uh, as trevor mentioned earlier when we were having our pre conference pre meeting discussion if the the plant is not getting adequately pollinated you might need to have a pollinator tree nearby the other thing would be a lack of zinc in the uh, plant and and that can be tested by a soil test to see if you there's two things you can do first do a soil test to see if the soil is zinc deficient but sometimes the foliage even though there's plenty of zinc it's not getting into the tree so the foliage you can actually if you do your own pecans you can do a tissue test to test for zinc levels with uf ifas you can send that off for a tissue analysis to see if you have z your zinc levels right in the tree and a lot of growers will use a foliar zinc spray to to help or just a, a zinc fertilizer um and that can help help with the nuts filling out properly and the last thing would be if your ph is too low pecans prefer ph between six and seven okay relatively so that's acid to neutral slightly acid to neutral and and oftentimes our soils are too low but you don't want your ph too high above seven and a half is bad because then you'll get more problems with uh, alkaline so uh those four factors could be influencing the the nuts not filling out so uh in that in those cases it could also be i've seen on really really old trees that uh depending how old your tree is they that happens too with extremely old good shade trees but they're no longer optimal producers all right. And one last thing, if it's a seedling tree that's been there for years, sometimes seedling trees are just never going to fill out properly if it's yeah, not a named variety. Something that just volunteered. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, all right. Thank you, Matt. Uh, this is gonna, this is a question for all of y'all because, uh, I mean, unless one of y'all want to raise your hand as our passion fruit expert, uh, but uh, we have a question that came in on passion fruit, passion vine. You know, they're getting lots of flowers, but no fruits. Uh, what might be happening there? Do they need more than one vine? Uh, is it nutritional or, you know, soil related? What do you think might be going on there? I, I have, I don't have a lot of experience with passion fruit. The one uh, passion fruit we, we planted did not survive the first winter. So, I, all I know was that they're not very cold hardy for us in Tallahassee. So we didn't um, try to grow those anymore, but um, I don't I know, know a whole lot. I mean, I know but, we have some wild maypops. Um, you know, that's another common name uh, for passion vine fruit. And um, they grow wild uh, in the woods every now and again, you can find them. Um, it might be something yeah. to do with the variety, Matt. What, what do you got to add to that? Yeah, well, I would suggest contacting a native plant nursery and getting one that's adapted to our climate. Oftentimes, the ornamental ones that are really showy are not fruit, adapted to fruit in our area. So if you can try one that is a native stock from a native nursery. I know Tallahassee has native nurseries. North of Defuniac Springs, another one native nursery. So there's lots of native nurseries around to go to and try to find these plants. Yeah, I mean, I know I've, I've found them out in the wild and uh, some folks have sent us pictures saying, you know, what is this thing? Uh, and we explain it and say, you know, hey, try them out. You might like it. Um, let's see. Someone just asked, uh, they were unable to sign in at the beginning and will playback be available? Yes, this will be posted on the Garden uh, Gardening in the Panhandle website. So you can go back and watch this uh, as many times as you'd like. Uh, Beth Bowles, who's playing behind the scenes here, she added that you you know, maybe a pollination issue going on with the passion vine and the passion fruit. So, um, you know, just encouraging bees and pollinators in any kind of way possible to help make sure that uh, that vine gets pollinated. Um, this one's also open to the panel. I, I have no idea about this question, but it's hazelnuts. Can we grow hazelnuts here? Anybody even know? I see Trevor saying, I have no idea. I've Danielle. never heard of it in Florida. Yeah, I've never heard anyone growing hazelnuts in Florida. Uh, there's probably a reason why we haven't, right? Because maybe it's not, maybe it just doesn't do well here. Um, 
Uh, one more. So let's bring up avocados. And so, you know, they were mentioning on Facebook, I believe they were asking about growing avocados in the panhandle. And this comes up, right, because you throw an avocado in the compost pile and it sprouts, right? And you want to try to grow out your avocado. Um, or there may be folks selling, you know, avocados that are, you know, more cold tolerant. So who wants to speak on avocados? And Xavier, we're going to come to you after they speak about growing them, because I think you have something to say about uh, potential problems with avocados. So uh, anyone want to handle the avocado growing issue in the panhandle? I'll go first. If that's all right. Please try. Um, we actually had um, avocado in our nursery, in our, in our orchard. And um, they did produce. Uh, I think the variety was a Mexicola, but the, 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 the fruit itself was probably smaller than a golf ball. Mm. So it wasn't you know, your best looking um, fruit and um, it struggled and it wasn't the cold weather that killed it. I think it was some uh, beetle that started feeding into the trunk of the tree that terminated it. They are, um, in my opinion, not very easy to grow. And um, they, the seeds that fall in the compost pile you're not going to get no avocado from growing those trees. That's not going to happen. If the winter don't kill it, they're probably going to outlive you. Uh, all right. And now that, you know, the, that insect issue, Xavier, talk to us about uh, no, erosion, I mean, right? And wilt. Yeah. Um, so uh, in fact, uh, uh, so we have this disease in North Florida called laurel wilt, and it's a, a disease due to a, a fungi um, that is um, transmitted by a small beetles, a scolite, a small scolite uh, beetles, uh, very tiny beetles in fact. Um, anyway, um, and this beetle is called the red bay ambrosia beetles because the main host is uh, red bay and overall loracy tree and um, avocado is a loracy tree. So anyway, um, this disease kill your loracy tree, so red bay or swam bay, for instance, in a matter of weeks. It's uh, incredible how fast it goes. Um, and um, it, it happened that avocado are sensitive to this disease. So uh, avocado are not the preferred host for um, um, the red bay ambrosia beetles, but they, not at all, in fact. Uh, but uh, what can happen is that uh, the fungi, the spore of the fungi, can be transmitted to a different beetle that will bore into uh, your uh, avocado. So, for instance, one of the common ambrosia beetles we have is uh, the Asian uh, ambrosia, be ambrosia beetles. And um, this Asian number of beetles may uh, feed, for instance, on a dead red bay infected with laurel wilt and would capture the spore. And then after will move to your avocado, bore in your avocado and transmit the disease. So uh, to give you an idea, it's pretty good to have a, here a wood. Uh, it's not, um, so it's not um, an avocado, it's a tongue, tongue uh, tree with a uh, a boring uh, gallery. I don't know if you can see it very well. No, not very well. But anyway, a gallery of um, ASEAN um, ambrosia beetles, and it's pretty pretty wide. Like you can see here, and you see the gallery go up up inside uh, in the xylem. So if you have some notion of uh, of uh, uh, plant physiology. Yeah, the, so it's basically going the inside, uh, very deep in the in the branch. And here, typically, what's going to happen? You're going to have a dieback of the of the, of the plant because the circulation is blocked. Anyway, but um, what what happened is the ambrosia beetles. They also do the gallery, and then they will have a fungi in in it, and the fungi will multiply and create resurrection. Uh, and the tree has 
as an immune reaction and the tree um, overreact and kind of shut down all the circulation of the nutrient and then die in matter of weeks. So yes, so um, you may uh, have this issue of uh, ambrosia beetle that may transmit this disease to avocado. Uh, what we found works pretty well to uh, repel the beetles uh, is called verbenon. Verbenon uh, is uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a repellent, it's an odor that these beetles don't like. And you can either apply it directly uh, uh, as, um, or you can either put it as a lure that will this uh, they will release this this uh, very uh, this odor to the tree and the beetle will avoid it. So it's called verbenon. It works pretty well. Um, and you have either lure dispenser or you have uh, like um, pasts you can directly put on the trunk. Trunk. So they have different way you can kind of protect your tree again uh, against ombrosia beetles. So if you need any information, I would be more than happy to. All right, thank you, Xavier. Yeah, I did, you know, we had a, a call come in and there was a fellow that lived uh, right down the street from the office near FAMU campus who had a, a mature avocado tree. And it, I was impressed, first of all, that it had lived that long and was producing avocados, but it came down with Laura Wilt and the, the, it was gone within months, I think the whole tree was dead. So, and then, remo and then recently uh, I picked up uh, my son at a friend's house and his dad was showing me around the yard and he had just recently purchased, you know, cold hardy avocados. Mm -hmm. They were damaged this past winter. And if you remember our past winter was not very cold. So if they were damaged in that winter, then, you know, things aren't looking good for, you know, future mm -hmm. winter, we actually get a, a real cold. So, um, you, know, you know, Mark, it's all about a microclimate like that other one that was near FAMU, you know, that microclimate may have worked there but not at your friend's house so it's just a microclimate situation and i say if if you don't have a lot of money invested give it a shot and but don't expect success with it with it yeah uh let's see i think we've gone through most of the questions but we did have some um i think we had a question on, on on pitches right i didn't answer um we sent, we kind of sent them, yeah, your internet went out, but we sent them, uh, we sent them some information and hooked them up. Um, the, there was a question on, you know, we talked about root pruning the citrus in the pots. Is there a particular time of the year that you all think that would be better to be done? Oh, definitely in the springtime. Um, don't do it in the winter time because, or fall time, because a citrus tree needs all of whatever it has it needs all of the roots and, and branches it can to withstand the winter winter time so if you're going to grow it in a pot uh springtime would be actually let me think after harvest directly after harvest no but in springtime before they flower because uh because physiologically you don't want to do that when they have fruit on them so it has to be springtime before they flower because after harvest you're still fighting that cold weather you may have to deal with and you wouldn't want to do it that's my opinion. Okay, thank you, Matt. Um, here's a question again related to citrus, and you know the the person is asking their citrus is grown on a hill, and so I think with just you know some runoff and erosion, the some of the roots have become exposed. So, what you know what is a good recommendation? Should they cover that with mulch? Should they cover that with soil? You know how should they handle um, how should they handle that? And if you want to go into the whole debate about should we mulch citrus trees in Florida? Open to the panel. Well, if nobody else will, <laughs> I, I'll start. The, the, the debate about mulch versus mulch, I mulch, but my reason for mulching is because we want to keep the string trimmer away from the trunk of the tree. And that's the main reason. So it's not for the moisture holding or none of those things. We, we, we have someone who is contracted to do the lawn. And if we have any kind of weeds or grass growing near the, the trees, they, well, they have done it before. So they would, they, they would put that trimmer right up against it and they'll kill it. So 
Um, as far as covering the roots, because citrus roots um, naturally grows closely to the surface of the soil. You know, it's it's very it's very natural for them to have that. I have so I have an orchard over in Quincy, and we have an area somewhat similar to what this person is asking, where there's some runoff, and some of the roots are bare, and um, we haven't done anything with them yet, and they're, they seem to be doing okay. But I, it wouldn't hurt to cover them with some soil. Anyone else want to add to that? I think, okay. As you recover from soil, you know, one, one of the main techniques we have to protect citrus from cold is to uh, cover the trunk of young trees with soil. And uh, it's very one of the simplest way you can um, do to protect your tree during winter time. If you have a small tree, you want to protect it from uh, freeze events, uh, probably around November is a good practice to uh, just uh, cover with a pile of soil all your trunk. Uh, and uh, that that will help your your tree to pass the the winter if you have a like a big freeze event that may happen sometime. All so, right. So yeah, that's the, the so what everyone alluded to there is yeah the gist of keeping the trees bare without mulches for so that heat can radiate up from the soil. So if you wanted to, you could mulch them during the year and then pull it back. Uh, that would not be a problem. Um, and then because uh, the heat from the soil radiates up better when there's no mulch but but you like trevor said with the lawn situation that's a whole nother thing so it's really a personal preference uh there's there's literature on both sides of the issue so yeah i know that it's been an issue before we've dealt with where i think in california it's recommended to use mulch in florida it's recommended not to use mulch because of uh, maybe some fungal or soil diseases um but there may be a reason that you want to put it like your your mowing crew is going to you know girdle your tree with a string trimmer if you don't. Um, well, folks, uh, we still have 20 folks. We're gone 20 minutes over and we still got 20 folks wanting to listen to, you know, uh, the panelists here talk about their fruit trees and their fruit tree recommendations. So thank you all for being with us. And maybe uh, Beth and Matt, if you will put the survey link up there one more time. And for folks that are still with us, again, if you will please uh, fill out the survey, let us know how we did. Um, we'd really appreciate that. And once that gets up there, I think we will sign off for the day. We do have uh, the next Gardening in the Panhandle Live will be September 24th. And it's going to be all about growing in Florida soils. So. Um, you know, we'll, uh, I know in the panhandle, we range from sugar sand to uh, clay or more clay type soil. So that should be a, an interesting talk. Uh, so we appreciate all of you being here and, um, panelists, you want to say goodbye to the crowd? Bye-bye. See you later. Thanks Bye. for growing. Thank you. Aloha. Bye everyone. And thanks for being with us and hope to see you again on the next Garden in the Panhandle Live. Bye, y'all. Bye-bye.